Hey, hey, welcome back, everyone, to another broadcast of In the Trenches. I'm your host, Tom Morkis, and I'm excited to sit down today with Jordan Harbinger. Jordan is a Wall Street lawyer turned interview talk show host and communications and social dynamics expert. Jordan was also the host of a top 50 iTunes podcast called The Art of Charm for over a decade, which received over $4 million per month, making the show one of the most popular podcasts in the world. However, Jordan has since left The Art of Charm to start his own endeavor, The Jordan Harbinger Show, and he's building this platform and this new podcast completely from scratch. So I brought Jordan on today to talk about what that's like to go from $4 million a month to zero and have to build back up from scratch. And so today we kind of take a look at what led Jordan to this path that he's taking now, some of the hard decisions he's had to make, some of the business aspects of what he's doing, but we also get into some of the very practical steps and elements of starting and growing a podcast in present day where there's thousands and thousands of podcasts and it's one of the most popular and growing medium for people to spread the word. And it's not as easy to get to the top of iTunes as it used to be maybe a decade ago, which is not to diminish his accomplishment with The Art of Charm, which is no small feat at all. It's more a point of how difficult it now is. And so far, Jordan is off to a fantastic start. And so I wanted to really learn what he's doing, what's working, what's not, the things he's leveraging, where he's putting his time, money, and energy to grow his podcast and kind of where he sees this going in the future. So if you've ever considered creating a podcast, today's episode will be very, very interesting. Even if you're not interested in a podcast, though, you might find this story interesting, how Jordan's had to completely pivot and start completely from scratch after a decade of work and what that transition is like. It's not easy and it hasn't been easy, but Jordan's making the most of it and doing a great job. And so he's going to share his insights, tips, best kept secrets, and everything else on growing a podcast, building his platform, and what he's doing now to really make an impact in the world in his own way and on his own terms. So without further ado, let's get to today's interview. So Jordan, the way I want to kick things off is give us like a snapshot view of where you're at right now. A lot of people know you from where you were before, but now you have the Jordan Harbinger show. And offline, we were just talking about how you've already done in the, I think what was the first month, you've done over a million downloads on your new podcast, which is pretty remarkable for anybody who hasn't done a podcast. That's remarkable for anybody who has. That's like, and you can be envious of that. So give me kind of an idea, kind of where you're at rebuilding kind of your platform and building jordanharbinger.com and with your new show, what you're doing to grow it. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity, man. I, a few months ago was I would say blindsided, except it's not totally true. I had a a split with my business partners and I would say that it was a surprise, but it was only a surprise in the way that it was handled. It really wasn't a surprise that the split needed to happen. It needed to happen for years. So what didn't work out as planned was I was supposed to take the art of charm and continue doing that show, but instead ended up found myself in a place now where I'm starting over quote unquote from scratch. And after I you know, got done crying in my cereal about that, I realized I'm never really starting from scratch because not only do I have my skills that I built over 11 and a half years of doing the Art of Charm and that I bring to the Jordan Harbinger show, but around well, almost the entire team also ended up leaving the company and coming with me at that time. And so I brought what I consider to be all the talent over to the new show, which has been great. Also, In the first month, yeah, we had 1.3 million downloads. And this is, you know, I didn't have social media, didn't have an email list, didn't even have a website up. So that this volume of downloads for the Jordan Harbinger show is increasing. And all a lot of the things that I thought would be tough about starting over really turned out to be not as scary as I thought, if that makes sense. So things like, oh, no, I'm not going to be able to get guests that didn't happen. Guests are in fact even more likely to come on the Jordan Harbinger show than they are on the Art of Charm in my experience because the brand is a little more, uh, let's say, family friendly. So they don't have to explain to their boss, publicist, colleagues that they're going on this podcast and that the name isn't about this and that and the other thing. They really can just go on the Jordan Harbinger show and there's no like stigma attached, no sort of dating branding from days of yore like we used to have on the Art of Charm. And Also, all of the opportunities that I had publicity wise, speaking gigs, deals, all that stuff that I thought was going to be unavailable to me has actually increased because a lot of people 
heard about what happened and want to help. So I'm getting invited to more conferences. I'm getting invited to do more media. I'm getting invited to write more pieces for outlets. I'm getting invited to do more collaborations, go on on more podcasts like this one. So it really turned out to be a weird blessing in disguise, although the business is so much smaller than it was back just a few months ago for me. I see all ready that this is all the people that I talked to that said, this is going to be the best thing that ever happened to you. You don't even know yet. I see now that those people were right and are right. And it really gave me a, a unique reason to reach out to my entire network and ask for help in a way that was cool, in a way that it was humbling, but also, but not humiliating. Right. I think a lot of people were like, oh man, it must be so humiliating to reach out and tell people that you got pushed out of this company that you started 11 and a half years ago. And to be honest, it really wasn't one. It was a long time coming in two. I don't think anybody that says, oh, you got pushed out of your company. You're an idiot. I mean, how many people like that are there? It's kind of like saying, Oh, I heard my friend's getting divorced. What a loser. You don't do that, right? When your friend's getting divorced, you think, oh man, that's tough. I should be there for that person. And so that's been my experience is overwhelmingly positive, not this sort of like tail between your legs negativity. And I think part of that is because I was doing a lot of relationship creation and management over time. And so it's not embarrassing to ask for help when you've been so valuable to friends in your network in the past. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And and again, I think it's a remarkable kind of story of pivoting, a forced pivot, let's put it that way, from being taken out of what you were doing before, having to readjust and figure things out, but also, and in that way, kind of the most difficult kind of pivot there could be where it's like, it just kind of, the, the you got, it got pulled out from under you with where you were at and having to start from scratch. It's not like you're taking a brand and then re-engineering it, but actually starting from scratch. So the fact that you're already up to, you know, over a million downloads for a podcast is really fast. And I looked at some of the people you've already had on your show, like Jocko Willicks and I think Simon Sinek and a bunch of other just remarkable people. So you're obviously not having trouble getting the interviews and lining up the great guests. So I'm curious, like, what is your, as you're building this now, kind of starting over from scratch, you rebranded to your own name. I'm curious why that decision. So I rebranded to my own name because when I was doing the other show, I was always hamstrung by that name. People would go, why do you want me on your show? I'm not talking about charm. Or I would try to have some I'd have some political thinker on there or I'd have like, a, I, I remember I had General Stanley McChrystal tell me, well, I don't know much about this. You know, I don't lead with charm. <laughs> and I just like got really sick of having to fight my own brand. So rebranding to my own name means that I can talk about whatever's interesting to me. So that became really important because what's interesting to me is interesting to the audience for the most part. So I don't have to hamstring myself or pigeonhole myself and go, all right, this is a self-help show. Let's call it self-help for learn to be great podcasts, you know, and then people who aren't interested in that go, oh yeah, I'm not into that. Right. So I can do an episode on money laundering, but I can also do an episode on the Russian situation or, or something like this that really does have practical takeaways from the person explaining it. So I have Larry King coming on to talk about conversational skills, but I can also have a CIA agent come on and talk about how they read people. And then I can have Simon Sinek come on and talk about find your why. And all of these people, what they have in common is they're delivering practical application which is the name of the show, the, the main idea of the show, right, is that every episode has practical things the audience can actually use right out of the box. Every characteristic a person has is a learnable, teachable skill. And I have worksheets for every single episode. So these things are really important for my audience, right? But you don't have to have it be like, this is a show about charm that occasionally does a little offshoot about something else. This is a show about becoming a better person, but I don't have to name it that because People who are really into self-help might react to that, but I'm not looking for the traditional sort of personal growth audience that's already overwhelmed with content. I'm looking for kind of a more normal, professional audience that's interested in learning, but not that's interested in like, I want to be the best version of myself. You know, that those cliches, I think, are, are inherently limiting. And so does that dictate too, um, as you kind of are positioning yourself this way, which it sounds like it's at least immediately, it's more in alignment with who you are and what you want to do. That's very clear. But on another note, it is a slight shift then from what you did before 
Is there, what do you see as like the business purpose behind it? Or not, that's the wrong way to ask it, but where do you see as the business opportunity behind it, kind of expanding that or changing the audience or the, the focus to maybe more professionals? Not that it wasn't like it before, but I'm just curious in your mind, like, where does this go? Where do you take this? Yeah. So what was happening with the old show was that we found that the audience was largely professional and we were starting to get more women and more professionals, but we also, every single day, I would get this question how do I convince my friends to listen to this? And shows that have good brand alignment or businesses that have good brand alignment, they don't have to answer that question. They don't have to worry about that. People don't go to Whole Foods and then go, man, how do I tell my other healthy friends that they should shop here? People don't go to CrossFit or fitness classes and then say, how do I get my other friends who are into fitness to come to this? way that you do that is you say, hey, I go to this great gym. They have awesome classes. Hey, I go to this store. They have great health food and it's really tasty. You don't have that problem. But when I have a show that's about or perceived to be about picking up chicks, dating, whatever, and then I go, yeah, I have this episode that's about managing anxiety in a difficult situation or making tough decisions. And I interviewed a general people who want to share that. They go, oh, man, how am I going to get my boss? to listen to this show without embarrassing myself or insulting them by sort of implying that they need to learn the topics covered here. That's a huge problem. So I don't have to change my audience. My audience has already changed over. We didn't have a lot of like lonely loser guys listening to the show that needed to learn how to get women. In the percentage of the audience that we did have of that at the Art of Charm, I was more than happy to leave behind. I don't really want to serve that audience. I want to serve the the men and women, young professionals, uh, middle-aged people that want to learn and grow and learn actionable, teachable skills. But I want to serve that audience in every respect. So other problems that we had with the brand alignment of the old show was I would get a letter from a 50-year-old woman who's like, I really want to come to one of your programs and I want to bring all the ladies that work in my accounting firm It's mostly women because I love the networking skills that you teach. And I go, cool. We don't offer any programs where women are allowed because we have men only residential boot camps that are about dating. And they would go, what the hell? And I'd go, sorry. And they'd be like, well, I don't get it. And I'd be like, yeah, you have to ask my business partners about this. So now I I don't have to change the audience. I don't even have to change the focus. I just have to serve the audience better, which is the reverse problem that a lot of pivots have in the business or businesses that pivot have. You know, you pivot and you go, oh, uh, our app was originally about ordering food online. Now it's about food reviews. Now we have to find people who want to review food instead of targeting people who wanted to order food online because that market's saturated or whatever. I had the opposite issue, which was everybody wanted to review food and I was selling food, right? And it's like, uh, hey, can we review food? No. Well, we want to review food. Too bad. All you can do is order it. But I want to review the food. Tough. Now that I'm gone, I can be like, guess what? We got food reviews. And they're like, oh, finally. So my inbox now with the Jordan Harbinger show is full of people that go, thank goodness I can tell my friends about this now. Or I'm so glad I don't have to keep my phone screen off so people don't see what I'm listening to. Or, hey, are you going to have events and products? Because now I can finally recommend that my employees and my colleagues go do these personal growth programs because I'm not going to get reported to HR for recommending that a male or female employee go listen to the art of charm because all I have to do is recommend the Jordan Harbinger show. So we left behind a lot of what I would consider a stigma being attached to that brand. And that for me is a huge relief. So my audience that's largely coming with me is more in align with the brand. The brand changed last, which is the opposite of how pivots usually work. Usually you pivot by changing the function, the brand, the product, and then you have to find a new audience and that's the pivot. My pivot was, here's what everybody wants from me and I can finally give it to them because I'm not fighting internally with my business partners about what that actually is. So let me ask you this, because I think this is actually kind of interesting. Having built already one, like such a successful platform, podcasting being one of the main mediums and modes that you did that, and now you're starting kind of over from scratch, but already having this success, you're bringing a lot of years of experience to the table. So what's one thing that you are doing purposely differently? And is there anything that you're also kind of 
keeping the same that you're like, this is success. Like this worked so well, we're going to keep doing this, but here's maybe one thing I'm doing like totally differently because of the space and time we're in right now. Yeah. So the first part of your question was, what am I changing? I mean, what I'm changing is I'm no longer speaking directly to men only. I used to have to do that. It was kind of like, that was what our products and services were in the other business. And that was inherently limiting. So I'm changing that. I'm speaking with smart men and women in general. I'm no longer focusing on topics of interest to men only, et cetera. I am also, what I'm keeping though, is, is the quality of guests and the quality of interview. I think it's really tempting when you pivot or when you start a different kind of business to sort of like, what do you want to call it? Like you think, okay, I want to speak specifically to this type of customer and I'm only going to speak to that type of customer because that's what I'm used to. So I'm not really forced to do that now. I can really broaden the topics that I discuss the person, the consumer avatar, if you will, can really be open, but I'm able to keep the same, the level of quality, the level of preparation. You know, I spend 10 to 12 hours preparing for each guest that's on the Jordan Harbinger show. You know, I read their book. I create the worksheet for the practical exercises. I want to take other people, the guests, I want to take their superpowers and teach them to the audience because it's really, the show's not just about the guest. It's about what the guest can teach the listener. So I still take that particular tack with every interview, highly practical, highly useful, entertaining, high caliber of guest, not letting the guest get away with canned or cheese ball answers or cliches, stuff like that, that goes naturally in line with my personality. But I'm able to really open up the floor, both in terms of topic and in terms of consumer avatar, which for me is really exciting. Like, I want to be able to talk to a general audience of people that are educated and successful not just guys in their 20s or 30s because that's what we sell and that's what's been selling and that's where our funnels are. You know, that to me was always really limiting and I never really saw myself as some kind of like dating coach going into my 40s especially. That to me just sort of seemed a little bit sad and now I don't have to worry about that consequence because I'm free of those constraints. What's the number one way that you're kind of growing the audience right now? I mean, you mentioned a couple of things. It sounds like it's choosing the right guests. So they're, you know, great, great guests. You're doing your homework on each one so that the interview itself is quality. So assuming somebody is like kind of hitting all the right pieces of the quality aspect of podcasting, for example, are there any other things you're doing right now to like spread the word or grow the listenership that you find is actually working? Yeah. So what I've found is that going on other shows and discussing things in a vulnerable, accessible way has been really positive. I think it's really tempting to go on other media, whether you're writing, going on podcasts, doing social media, and especially in the personal development space, there's this temptation that a lot of people seem to succumb to that is something along the lines of seem infallible, seem like this great leader who never makes a mistake, seem like this sort of faux, humble, thought leader. I hate that term, but it's appropriate in this particular sense. And people will follow you because they're looking for this role model. And I'm like, that's great. But the problem with it is it doesn't match people's experience. You know, entrepreneurs or people who live life in general, they run into hard times. They run into conundrums and quandaries and they feel down sometimes. And if you're sort of busy pretending like that never happens to you, or you're talking about oh yeah, a long time ago I was depressed and stressed, but now I've got this multi-million dollar business and I fly around on private jets everywhere hanging out with Tony Robbins. And it's like, oh cool, if only I had that. But that sort of aspirational stuff is kind of BS. And it really makes people who are going through a problem right now feel a little bit isolated because it's like, oh, if, if he can get through it and do that, that's great. But what's helping you get through it right now? And so I wanted to go out and share this message and be a little bit more authentic with it in that, like, look, this is something I'm happening that's happening to me and my business right now, but I'm able to recover in this certain way that I think is much more applicable. Like, look, I lose sleep at night. I'm dealing with legal junk back and forth and harassment and all this other garbage. And, you know, I have certain groups of fans that came with us. And then there's other people who, who didn't, and there's people that are confused and there's people that wrote everybody off because of this stuff. And you just can't really let all of this stuff 
bug you all the time. You know, you have to focus on moving forward and you have to really stay in the trenches, uh, no pun intended with the title of the show here, but you really do have to continue to work your butt off and you can't really cry over spilled milk. And so these lessons of going through this and in the moment working on it in a way that's beneficial instead of just putting it all so far in the past, like, you know, in five or 10 years, I'll probably be telling the story, oh yeah, you know, and I separated from this old business and da da da, and I rebuilt this and look where we are now. That's helpful, but it's less helpful to somebody who's going through a hard time right now and trying to crawl out of the pit. And so I'm I'm speaking from a position now of being in in the pit and in the trenches. And I think that's helped grow the show a lot because people go, oh, I want to hear what this is. I want to hear what these guests have to say and grab these worksheets and have these sort of learnable skills that Jordan's talking about on the show. But they also want to be a part of the recovery of something that is to them was special if they listened to the old show or a part of building something new. I think that's exciting for people. So going on shows has helped really grow the show in a lot of ways, but sharing vulnerably and not trying to sugarcoat the situation has really made for a lot of great conversations with a lot of fans, new and old, because I think it's a refreshing, in my opinion, in my experience, it's a refreshing take that I think most people aren't willing to do. Most people are not willing to discuss these types of very personal sort of hurtful things that are going on in their lives because they feel like it makes them less than. And I disagree with that. I don't think that's the way to go. I don't think it's good to sugarcoat everything so that you seem like Superman so that people buy your book. Like I disagree with that way of marketing. Yeah. I would also say that too, a big piece where it comes into play for you, I think where you're able to get away with this, so to speak, get away with it, is that you've already demonstrated that you can do the job and you can get, you know, you do the work and you get the results. Like you've already built up something to a sizable level of success. And I think that gives you credibility where if there's a downturn, it makes you very, like immediately, uh, I'd say, you know, somebody that that people can resonate with, but also still believe in because it's like, wow, okay, look at what he'd done before. Yeah, he's pivoting or now he's, he's had some hardships, but he's, he's growing from there. So I think a big part of that is the fact that you, as a person, as a business brand, you've already kind of been there, done that as well. So to go through those hardships, it does make you more personable for sure. But I feel like that might be a big piece of the pie or puzzle tier too for you. Not so much that you're going through the struggle and sharing that so much as, I mean, that's a piece of it, but that you've already proven that you've been able to do great things versus, I guess I'm only making that distinction to think, well, if somebody is working and, and building something that I'm not sure uh, how great sharing the downside of what they're doing, if they haven't actually proven the point that they can do it in the first place. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. It definitely does. And I won't pretend that a lot of the people that are coming to the new show aren't coming from the old one, but we are getting a lot of new folks coming in, in part because the branding changed, but also in part because of the messaging. So, you know, you're asking what the highest leverage thing is to bring people into a show. And the answer is always to find listeners where they are, which is listening to podcasts in the first place. So that is super useful, in my opinion, to go and do that. But I also think that you could really go, I mean, there's plenty of examples of people going on other shows and not having it convert back. And I remember when I first started doing this years and years ago, going on other shows and interviewing and things like that, it wasn't really a big audience builder because I didn't know what I was doing, right? You have to frame things in the, for the benefit of the, of the listener. And I think a lot of people will go on a show and talk only about themselves and not talk about the way that they can create value for the listener, which totally makes sense. It's very much human nature to do that. But if we talk about how we're managing some of the anxiety of these changes, or if we're talking about some of the the value of networking and things like that, which are some of the topics that I really focus on on the Jordan Harbinger show, that stuff is extremely useful and sticky because at a certain point, the story gets less interesting than the content, than the takeaway, the learning teachable moments, if you will. Okay, so here's one of my final questions. I'm curious with what you're doing now and the direction you're going. With Art of Charm and what you did before, you had courses that you sold. I believe you guys had sponsors for your podcast. With what you're doing now, and obviously you were doing speaking gigs and stuff like that, it sounds like you're still doing the speaking gigs. Well, now you've grown the audience, so I assume that maybe there'll be some revenue from sponsors for your podcast. I'm curious, are you going to be rolling out courses or anything like that in the future? Like, Where do you see this going in the future in, in different ways that, you know, to quote unquote, monetize it? Yeah. So I have courses that I'm designing this month and in the next quarter as well. I also have live events that I'm working on as well with my marketing team. I'm, I'm actually in 
Colorado, your state right now, working on all of that with my marketing team and just took a, let them take a break to, to come and do this. So I'm going to be rolling out online courses as well as live events. And uh, fortunately, my network, my podcast network, Podcast One, re-signed the new show and sent all of the advertisers over to the new show from the old one. So we didn't nice. really lose any sponsors, which is fantastic. Yeah, that was uh, that was great. And even a lot of the sponsors that were like, oh, hey, this is a new show, most all of them have decided that they're going to bet on us. And so they all kept their ad packages with Podcast One and therefore with our new show. So that was pretty great. And that really does speak to some of the stuff that we were doing all these years, digging the well before we were thirsty, building and maintaining those relationships before we needed them, giving very generously to other people without trying to keep score or asking for something in return or doing quid pro quo. We were just really generous with our help with other people and connecting people to each other inside our network and really just trying to promote valuable interactions between people that we knew inside our network, connecting people to others. And I know I feel like, you know, you've introduced me to a lot of people. I've introduced you to a a bunch of people as well. That kind of value and those kind of relationships done over the last decade and change really paid off. You know, we say dig the well before you're thirsty, uh, that title to that Harvey McKay book. But here's the thing. Most people never think they're going to be thirsty. So digging the well becomes a low priority when, oh, I've got to finish my website. Oh, I got to finish my product demo. Oh, I got to do this. And then maybe I'll start networking. You don't prioritize it. So me now, I really did dig the well before I was thirsty. Also never thinking I was going to be thirsty. I really did think that it was just a good way to live. And that I had to practice what I preach being Jordan Arbinger and teaching networking. I couldn't exactly not do it myself. So I did all of that stuff just thinking it was a good way to live. And now, man, now that I find myself on the outside of my old business, it is saving my butt, right? Because when you find yourself on the outside, your network really is your value proposition, not your skill set. You know, you bring, unless you plan to do everything yourself, you have to have great people around you. And the way to do that is, of course, to have those strong relationships. So, if I had left with just my skill set, I would have had a much tougher time rebuilding. But since I left and had my relationships intact, it's almost like I never left in a lot of ways. And that is hugely, I cannot overstate the importance of building and developing those relationships as a number one priority. I know people won't believe me, but if you do any, if you take away anything from this interview, Take away the idea that everything you're building now that you think is important is still not as important as the relationships in your life that you have with other people in your industry, outside your industry, et cetera. Nothing you do will be more important than your relationships. And I know that that doesn't sound right, especially to new entrepreneurs and new small business owners, but I promise you, 2020 hindsight, it's the best thing I've ever done. I love it, man. I completely agree. It reminds me of a quote from somebody who was recently on In the Trenches, actually, uh, Jordan Peterson. And he says, uh, pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. And I love that idea because that's what you were doing when you talk about digging the well before you need it, right? Do the work, you know, you're going to reap what you sow, but you have to sow that stuff and, and take care of it for a long time. And I think relationships are one of the most important aspects of that. So great advice, Jordan. I really appreciate it, man. I, I love having you on In the Trenches and sharing your story. Where can people reach out to find you and check out your podcast and get in touch with you? Sure. So you're listening to a podcast right now. Check out the Jordan Harbinger show in any podcast app. If you're on Android, you know, I recommend CastBox. And if you're on iPhone, I recommend CastBox as well. But, you know, I think people are probably already listening to a show, not trying to sell anything other than the idea that what we teach on the Jordan Harbinger show is going to be something that you can take with you for the rest of your life. You know, not just networking tips, not just classy interviews, but every episode has practicals that will change the way that you do business and change the way that you interact with others. And I think that is a benefit right there. So, and of course, if people for some reason can't use a podcast app to find the Jordan Harbinger show, you can find me at jordanharbinger.com and all of our events and products and things like that will be listed there and sent out to our list in the near future. I'm at Jordan Harbinger on Instagram and Twitter as well. Awesome. Well, Jordan, thank you so much for being in the trenches. It was a pleasure having you. Thanks for having me on, man. I, I appreciate it as always. And that wraps up another broadcast of In the Trenches. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please do me a favor and go to tomworkus.com slash iTunes. That's T-O-M, 
M-O-R-K-E-S dot com slash iTunes and leave a rating and review for In the Trenches. Not only do I read and appreciate every review, but it helps spread the word of this podcast and allows me to continue to get on great guests. So thank you for your support. 